Now to a mystery of 23 years. The sudden vanishing of a human being without a trace. It's like I, I was seeing a ghost. It's the stuff of nightmares. Hidden from view behind this fence is a secret maze. Families torn apart, entire communities left in shock, and mysteries that go cold for years, even decades. We have incredible breaking news tonight. But in some extraordinary cases, these vanishings have been solved in ways no one could have ever imagined. From individuals who were hiding in plain sight to astonishing twists that not even Hollywood could script. I want to assert my innocence. These are the top seven strangest missing persons cases and how they were solved. Number one, Leanne Tiernan. 16-year-old schoolgirl Leanne Tiernan was abducted less than one mile from her home on November 26, 2000, while returning from a Christmas shopping trip in Leeds, England. When she and her friend Sarah Whitehouse returned to Bramley by bus, the girls parted company, and Sarah last saw Leanne setting off along an unlit path through an area of wooded wasteland. Three hours later, her mother called the police, sparking one of the largest missing person inquiries in British history. Fears are growing for the safety of missing teenager Leanne Tiernan. Now three days since the 16-year-old went missing after a Christmas shopping trip with a friend. It involved the search of around 1,750 buildings, 32 drainage wells, the draining of a two-mile section of a canal, and the halting of household waste collections. But after nine months, there had been no positive sightings. On December 4, 2000, police released an e-fit facial composite of a man who had been seen walking a dog in the area shortly before Tiernan disappeared. Nine months later, on August 20, 2001, Tiernan's body was found by Mark Bisson, who was walking his two dogs in Lindley Woods, North Yorkshire. Tiernan was identified from her fingerprints two days later. Tiernan's body had been wrapped inside nine green plastic bin bags secured with twine, with a black bin bag secured around her head, with a leather dog collar, then placed inside a floral patterned duvet cover. The state of decomposition of Tiernan's body led some forensic experts to believe that after her death, she had been kept in cold storage, or a freezer, up until a few weeks before the body was found, in part to avoid detection, and in part as a trophy. Police believed that the dog collar must belong to whoever was responsible for killing Leanne. So they contacted every single one of the wholesalers who manufactured that particular leather dog collar and began asking for their records of sales to anyone in the Leeds area. They got a hit. One of the dog collars was sold to a man from Leeds, John Taylor. DNA for a hair found on the scarf around Leanne's neck was a 100% match to Taylor. And this was one of the first cases in British history where scientists were actually able to retrieve a DNA profile of a dog whose hairs were also collected from Leanne's body. John Taylor was therefore arrested and charged with murder. He claimed that he had abducted Leanne, but said her death was an accident. John said Leanne had fallen, but there was no evidence of any kind of fall. John also couldn't explain why Leanne had injuries from being strangled or why her hands were bound with the cable ties. On February 15, 2002, John was found guilty of murder and kidnap. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. Another strange aspect of this case was that Leanne's body was found just meters from where another murder victim, Yvonne Fitt, had been discovered buried in 1992, and, using John Taylor's DNA, he was found to be a match for two more sexual assaults in the same location. The police also reopened ten murder inquiries, where women were killed and buried in a similar way to the killing of Leanne Tiernan, leading to widespread speculation that John Taylor was in fact one of Britain's worst ever serial killers. Number 2. Sean Hornbeck Sean Hornbeck was an 11-year-old boy who was kidnapped while riding his bike to a friend's house near Richwoods, Missouri, on October 6, 2002. Sean had taken this path many times before, but this time, he passed by a man who bumped him with his truck. The man initially seemed concerned for Sean's safety, but moments later, 
put him into the back of his truck, and told him, you were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Sean's parents, Pam Akers and stepfather Craig Akers, focused all of their time looking for their son. They even set up a foundation to help look for missing and abducted children, which they called the Sean Hornbeck Foundation. Both Sean's mother and stepfather spent all of their money in retirement savings looking for Sean and paying investigators to help aid the police. What nobody knew at the time was that Sean was still alive and had been taken to an apartment in Kirkwood where he'd live with his kidnapper for the next four years. After tying him up and abusing Sean, the kidnapper, a man later revealed to be 37-year-old Michael Devlin, was going to kill him. But Sean negotiated to pose as his son in order to avoid death. This went on for years, and Sean Hornbeck was even allowed to see friends and use a cell phone after Devlin believed that the boy wouldn't try to run or reach the authorities. Sean would even reach out to his parents on a website they set up to receive tips on his disappearance. Using the name Sean Devlin, he cryptically wrote, How long are you planning to look for your son? However, Sean eventually became too old for Devlin, and the kidnapper was soon back on the streets to find a new victim. On January 8, 2007, Devlin abducted Ben Aunby at a bus stop in Beaufort, Missouri. But this time, Devlin was actually seen kidnapping the boy. One of Ben's friends, Mitchell Holtz, heard Ben's cries and reported the truck to the police. Ben's abduction and Holtz's quick thinking would eventually turn out to be Sean's salvation. The FBI received a tip that a truck matching the description of Devlin's was parked at a pizza restaurant in Kirkwood. The truck belonged to store manager Michael Devlin, and when interrogated by the FBI, Devlin confessed, and his home was raided. Police found both Sean Hornbeck and Ben Ownby playing video games inside. They, they have been re reunited. Um, obviously, there's some very happy people uh, that were here. At 4.30 on Friday afternoon, 13-year-old Ben Ownby and 15-year-old Sean Hornbeck were escorted into the Franklin County Sheriff's Department. Ownby was abducted Monday afternoon near his home in Beaufort, Missouri. Hornbeck disappeared four and a half years ago near his home in Richwoods, Missouri. Both boys appear at this point to be okay. Um, obviously, they'll be checked out uh, to make certain that they're, they're in good shape. The teenage Hornbeck we saw today looked nothing like the young boy from 2002. Michael Devlin pled guilty and was handed multiple life sentences for a total of more than 4,000 years behind bars. The two boys returned to a life of normalcy, and the discovery of them alive and well was named the Missouri Miracle. Number three, J.C. Dugard. On June 10th, 1991, 11-year-old J.C. Dugard was abducted outside of her home in South Lake Tahoe, California. Despite several witnesses, including Dugard's own stepfather, authorities had no leads as to who took her. That morning, Carl Probin, J.C.'s stepdad, dropped his 11-year-old stepdaughter off at the bus stop only a few yards from the family's home. Two strangers grabbed the child and pulled her into their car. Probin, still in his yard, saw this happen. The driver rolled down the window and tased Dugard unconscious with a stun gun before abducting her. His wife then dragged Dugard into the car and removed her clothing. JC's stepdad hopped on his bike and chased after the car, but he couldn't keep up. They were gone. Unfortunately, Initial searches led nowhere, and even dogs, aircraft, nor the FBI could track J.C. Dugard down. While authorities' efforts to locate her proved unsuccessful, J.C. Dugard was forced into a new life 170 miles away in Antioch, California, confined to the backyard of husband and wife kidnappers Philip and Nancy Garrido, where she was kept in a network of dilapidated tents and soundproofed sheds. Philip handcuffed her, and warned that trained Doberman pinchers outside the shed would attack her if she tried to escape. Philip Garrido was a registered sex offender and chronic drug user who was released on parole after serving time in prison for a previous assault in 1977. He married Nancy in 1981, after he met her visiting her uncle in the same prison. As a parolee, Garrido wore a GPS-enabled ankle bracelet and was regularly visited by parole officers, 
but they never properly searched the property to find evidence of JC. Whilst held captive by the Garritos, JC Dugard was renamed Alyssa by her captors, and Philip Garrido repeatedly assaulted her, leading to two pregnancies, the first at age 14 and the second at 17. Both times, Dugard gave birth to daughters, with the Garritos handling the deliveries themselves without medical care. Before long, her two daughters were living alongside her in the backyard captivity. Philip Garrido explained that the demon angels let him take her and that she would help him with his sexual problems because society had ignored him. Garrido would occasionally go on days-long methamphetamine binges, he called runs, during which he would force JC to keep him company by performing sexual favors and engaging in various other activities with him. JC took care of her daughters using information learned from television and homeschooled them inside the backyard tent complex. Garrido informed Dugard that to pacify his wife, Dugard and her daughters were to address Nancy as their mother and that she was to teach her daughters that Dugard was their older sister. JC was held captive for 18 years, but as time passed, she worked for the Garrido's printing business, would frequently talk to neighbors and customers, but she never revealed her real identity. Despite several missed opportunities by the police and Garrido's parole officer to uncover the crimes, JC was eventually saved in 2009 after a suspicious visit by Garrido to the University of California, where he was seeking permission to hold an event where he would recite a four-page essay explaining how he and others could curb their controlling impulses. Garrido truly thought he was a changed man. The alarm was raised because Garrido was accompanied by two pale young girls J.C.'s daughters. The next day, he was made to attend a parole meeting with Nancy, J.C., and the two girls. Maintaining her false identity as Alyssa, J.C. told investigators that the girls were her daughters. Although she indicated that she was aware that Garrido was a convicted sex offender, she stated that he was a changed man, a great person, and was good with her kids. She subsequently stated that she was a battered wife from Minnesota in hiding from her abusive husband. The parole officer eventually called the Concord police, and when they arrived, Garrido admitted the true identity of JC and what he had done. Philip and Nancy Garrido were placed under arrest. JC retained custody of her children and reunited with her mother on August 27, 2009, 18 years after her abduction. Philip Garrido denied he had ever harmed J.C. Dugard's two daughters and said their births changed his life. It's a disgusting thing that took place with me at the beginning, but I turned my life completely around. On August 28, 2009, Philip and Nancy Garrido pleaded not guilty to charges of kidnapping, assault, and false imprisonment in the case of J.C. Dugard. Despite ongoing legal maneuvering, including the removal of Nancy's attorney and the appointment of a new one, both ultimately confessed in 2011. Philip Garrido was sentenced to 431 years to life in prison, while Nancy received 36 years to life, making her eligible for parole in 2029. Despite growing up in captivity surrounded by abuse and neglect, J.C. Dugard has managed to turn her life around and move on from her imprisonment. In 2011, she published her first memoir, A Stolen Life, and founded the JAYC Foundation, an organization that provides support to families recovering from abductions and similar traumatic events. Number four, Shannon Matthews. On February 19th, 2008, nine-year-old Shannon Matthews was reported missing in Dewsbury, England. She was last seen at 10 past 3 in the afternoon outside her school, about 800 meters from her home. At 6.48 p.m., her mother Karen Matthews rang the police, reporting that her daughter had not returned home from school. More than 250 officers and 60 detectives were assigned, as the disappearance became a major missing persons case. More than 200 houses within a half-mile radius were searched, Officers moving from door to door, street to street, 
My priority at this moment in time is to locate Shannon safe and well. The Sun newspaper offered a reward of £20,000 for information leading to Shannon's safe return, and it was increased to £50,000 on March 10th, by which time she had been missing for 20 days. Karen Matthews was at the forefront of the appeal, making tearful appearances in front of news cameras pleading for her daughter's safe return. Many compared the case to the high-profile disappearance of Madeleine McCann a few years earlier, but said the class divide between the lower-class Matthews family and the middle-class McCanns made developments in this case less newsworthy. Karen Matthews took it upon herself, therefore, to provide theories and maintain relevance in the news cycle, explaining how she feared her daughter had been abducted by someone known to the family in order to get at her. The mother of four gave a somber yet resolute showing to the nation, who had not given up hope of finding the nine-year-old girl alive. However, on March 14th, almost one month after the disappearance, events took an unexpected turn. At lunchtime today, a team of officers smashed their way into this flat on Lydgate Gardens in Batley Carr, just one mile from Shannon's home in the heart of a community that has spent almost a month searching for her. Following a tip-off from neighbors, police raided the nearby home of Michael Donovan, the uncle of Karen's boyfriend, and found Shannon hidden in the base of a divan bed. The girl was unharmed, but had been drugged and tethered to limit her movement during her 24-day captivity. It was later revealed that Shannon was given a distinct set of rules to follow when she was awake, including how loud she could have the TV, and that she mustn't go near the windows. When confronted by police, Donovan confessed that he and Matthews had planned the abduction in a scheme to get reward money. He planned to eventually release Shannon and then find her, splitting the reward. Karen Matthews denied any involvement in her daughter's abduction, but along with Donovan, was found guilty and sentenced to eight years in prison. Donovan claimed that Karen Matthews had asked him to look after her daughter for several days and that they would make money from newspaper rewards. He told the court that she had threatened him with violence, and a forensic toxicologist told the court that tests on Shannon's hair indicated she had been given to Mazepam for up to 20 months before her disappearance. The judge called their scheme truly despicable. Karen now lives in the south of England and has become a born-again Christian, whereas Donovan has since died of cancer. Shannon Matthews was fostered by a new family living under a new name, due to how high-profile the case was in the UK. Number 5. Jamie Kloss 13-year-old Jamie Kloss was abducted from her home in Barron County, Wisconsin, on October 15, 2018. Jamie Kloss was awoken by the barking of the family dog, she peered out of the window to see a vehicle that she didn't recognize pulling up into the driveway. Concerned, she quickly alerted her sleeping parents, and her father, James, went to the front door to investigate while his wife and daughter hid in the bathroom. A man, dressed in a black coat and ski mask, began walking up the drive. When James Kloss shone a light from the window, the perpetrator fired a shotgun multiple times, killing the father. The man broke into the house and shot down the bathroom door. Inside the bathroom, the man bound Jamie's wrists and ankles using duct tape, then fatally shot Denise Kloss. The 13-year-old was then marched outside, where she was forced into the trunk of her kidnapper's vehicle. Upon arriving at the kidnapper's address over one hour away from her home in Barron County, Jamie was forced to undress and change into new pajamas. She was then forced to crawl under his bed, where she would remain for long periods of time without food and water, and the bed was blocked off and weighted down, so she could not move it to escape. It was later revealed they spent the next months watching TV, playing board games, and cooking homemade food together. The kidnapper was so confident that he decided not to take extra precautions and lock doors and windows. He believed he had Jamie under his spell. But after 88 days, on the afternoon of January 10, 2019, 
Jamie escaped. Tonight, 13-year-old Jamie Kloss is alive and safe, and even police here are stunned. My legs started to shake, man. It was, it was awesome. Three months after she disappeared, Jamie turning up 70 miles from the Wisconsin home where her parents were brutally murdered. When the kidnapper arrived home to find Jamie gone, he quickly realized she had fled. The girl had pushed away the heavy bins and weights, thrown on oversized New Balance shoes and fled the home, stopping a woman walking her dog. The woman, Jean Nutter, took Kloss to the nearest neighbor's house where they called 911. The police arrived around 4.45 p.m. and removed Jamie Kloss from the area for her safety. The description Kloss provided for her kidnapper and his vehicle enabled deputies to spot his car just minutes later. After a deputy stopped him, he exited his vehicle and said, I did it. His name was Jake Patterson. Prior to the abduction, police did not believe Patterson had any social media contact with Kloss or her family. And relatives of Kloss did not recognize Patterson's name. Patterson told authorities he saw Kloss getting off a school bus outside the family residence in September while he was driving home from work and that he knew that she was the girl he wanted to take. Patterson confessed to police that he had kidnapped Kloss and killed her parents. He had no previous criminal history in Wisconsin. On May 24th, Patterson was sentenced to the maximum of two consecutive life sentences in prison without the possibility of parole for the murders, plus an additional 40 years for the kidnapping. While in jail in March, Patterson wrote a letter in response to questions sent to him by a reporter from a television station in Minneapolis. He apologized for his crimes and stated they were committed mostly on impulse, contrasting with reports from the police that he had taken various measures in preparation. Although this case was solved, the motive for the abduction of Jamie Kloss has never really been explained. Number six, John and Linda Sohus. John and Linda Sohus were newlyweds living with John's alcoholic mother, Dee Dee, in San Marino, California. John was a computer programmer and Linda was an artist. They dreamed of escaping Dee Dee's home for a better life. And in February, 1985, they told family and friends they were leaving for New York, supposedly enlisted for a top secret government mission they were never seen again. In the weeks following, Linda's loved ones received mysterious postcards from the couple. Not from New York, Paris. The messages gave no explanation for why they were there or why they hadn't returned. After this brief contact, communication stopped. Dee Dee remained vague for weeks before finally reporting them missing detailing that it was a man named Christopher Chichester who told her they were leaving for a secret government mission. Chichester had been living in Dee Dee's, but, mysteriously, had also disappeared along with John's pickup truck. Three years later, after Dee Dee passed away, John's truck surfaced in Connecticut. A man named Christopher Crow attempted to sell it to a minister's son. Authorities soon discovered that Crow was actually Chichester, but he vanished before they could question him. In 1994, the case saw a break when a human skeleton was found buried in the Sohus' backyard. The remains, wrapped in three plastic bags, belonged to an adult male. Other Sohus' family members said the bones matched John's general description, and forensic evidence showed that the victim had been struck in the head two times with a rounded, blunt object, and then stabbed six times before his body had been cut into three parts. But without John's dental records or birth family due to him being adopted, authorities couldn't confirm if it was him. The case went cold until 2008 when, in a separate case, a man known as Clark Rockefeller abducted his own daughter in a custody dispute. During a TV appeal for information on the suspect, an old flatmate identified him as in fact Christopher Chichester, real name Christian Gerhardt's writer. 
He had masqueraded as an heir to the Rockefeller oil fortune for 20 years. In 2011, Gerhardt's writer was charged with John's murder. DNA testing, after locating John's birth family, confirmed the remains were his. At trial, witnesses testified about Gerhardt's writer's odd behavior at the time of the couple's disappearance. He had borrowed a chainsaw, attempted to sell a blood-stained rug, and there were signs a large amount of blood had been cleaned up in the guest house. A friend also noticed fresh digging near the house, where John's body was later found. In 2013, Gerhardt's writer was convicted of John's murder and jailed for 27 years to life. I, I want to assert my innocence and that I firmly believe that the victim's wife killed the victim, but be that as it may. Sadly, Linda's body has never been found, though police believe she was also killed by Gerhardt's writer. Number seven, Jan Broberg. In the early 1970s, 12-year-old Jan Broberg disappeared from her family's quiet life in Pocatello, Idaho. She had grown up in a religious and close-knit community, where her family trusted a man named Robert Berktold, known to Jan as B. Berktold had become deeply ingrained in their lives, earning their trust and becoming a constant presence in the household. One October day in 1974, Berktold took John on what was supposed to be a simple horseback riding trip, but neither of them returned. As days turned into weeks, the authorities struggled to track down any leads, while Jan's parents were left devastated. Slowly, they began to uncover the disturbing truth about Berchtold's intentions and his manipulative behavior toward their daughter. Berchtold had taken John across the Mexican border, exploiting his bond with her family to carry out the abduction. The FBI eventually found them in Mexico, but by that point, Berchtold had already exerted psychological control over Jan, convincing her of a bizarre and manipulative lie. Jan was told that she was supposed to save an alien race by having a child with Berchtold, and she needed to do this by age 16, or her family members would go blind or die. Fearing for her life and also the livelihood of the fake alien race, Jan and Berchtold had sex. Eventually, Birchtold wanted to return back to the United States, but needed the Broberg family to agree to the marriage in order to cross the border. The Broberg family did not agree, and instead flew to Mexico to retrieve their daughter. After returning to the U.S. himself, Birchtold was charged with kidnapping. Jan, clearly not thinking clearly, believed that she was truly in love with Birchtold. Though the two were not supposed to be together, they would write letters and talk on the phone, and she still listened to the tape recording, believing she still had a job to do in saving the alien race. The Broberg's family life declined, leading Marianne Broberg to actually have an affair with Berchtold. It lasted for almost a year, until they broke it off. Meanwhile, Berchtold was up on kidnapping charges, and Berchtold's wife, Gail, used the affair information to blackmail the Brobergs into lessening the charges. Berchtold was sentenced to serve five years in jail, but that was later dropped to 45 days. In the end, he spent roughly 10 days in jail. But it doesn't end there, as Jan was kidnapped, again. Berktold, who was now living in Salt Lake City, Utah, had enrolled Jan at an all-girls Catholic school in Pasadena, California. He told the school that he was CIA and that they were on the run. In an effort to keep John hidden away, he explained that if anyone came looking for her, they were the bad guys. The FBI contacted the school, but the school were reluctant to disclose Jan's information, assuming what Berchtold had told them was true. The FBI was able to get Jan out of the school and brought her back home to Idaho. Berchtold was charged with kidnapping again and was sent to a mental facility before being released six months later. In November 2005, Berchtold overdosed on a cocktail of heart medicine and died. So, that wraps up this countdown on Crime Collated. What do you think? Did we miss any cases out? Let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe to the channel.